Uh, so we have pretty much finished the um, assets and liabilities section of the balance sheet, and we are now going to jump into stockholders' equity. Um, much of this chapter should be a little bit of a refresher or repeat of various terminology that we used up until now, um, but we're going to dive in a little bit deeper. So you're going to learn some new vocabulary and um, a few new accounting rules. But again, some of this should ring familiar based on what we've done in the last nine chapters. So let's kick it off. So we're going to explain the features of a corporation. Again, this is largely repeat number one. Um, we already did this in the beginning of the class. Uh, we're going to account for issuing stock. This will largely be repeat, but we're going to throw in this par value concept, so it'll be a little bit new. Um, we'll talk about treasury stock and how that affects a company. Um, we'll account for, look at again at retained earnings, dividends, and stock splits. Uh, so we'll look at what those are and how we account for them. Uh, we'll look at a company's performance using some new ratios that we're going to learn. And then we'll um, show how we report stockholders' equity transactions in the financial statements. So first, the features of a corporation. Again, I'll go through this quickly because hopefully this is a repeat from um, earlier in the class. So a corporation, it's a separate legal entity, right? It has a continuous life. So if you create a corporation long after you've died, the company or the corporation is still around. It's fairly easy to transfer ownership. There are shares that are created. They represent ownership, and you can uh, transfer those shares. You have limited liability. You can only lose what you've invested in the company. Um, you ca they can't go after your personal assets. There's a separation of ownership and management. So if you think about it, if you own a share of Apple, you are ownership, but you're not managing Apple. So there's a team at Apple that does management. Um, you have this level of taxation. If you remember, there's two levels of taxation for a C corporation, which means that um, the corporation itself will pay taxes and then it pays out dividends to the owners and the owners have to pay in taxes on those dividends. And there's a lot of government regulation around corporations. So as a repeat, what are some of the advantages? Why would you set up a corporation? Easier to raise capital. It has a life that goes on forever. Very easy to transfer ownership. And it provides limited liability. What are some bad things? Well, you're now separating who owns it and who manages it. So that can become an issue. You get taxed double. Or you have this idea of double taxation. And you're going to expose yourself to a lot more government regulation. So how do you organize a corporation? So the corporate organizers, also called the incorporators, will get a charter from a state. The most popular is Delaware. Um, the charter, this is going to authorize the corporation to issue a certain number of shares of stock, right? So these are shares authorized. So we'll see that again here in a few slides. So just remember this is shares authorized. The incorporators, right, these organizers, they'll pay some fee, they'll sign the charter, they're going to file the documents with the state, and they'll agree to a set of bylaws. So here is a visual of what an organization looks like. So stockholders are the owners. Through an annual election, they will pick the board of directors. That board of directors will elect a chairperson for their board. Sometimes this person also becomes the chief executive officer of the company, but not always. And then, um, and also the president or chief operating officer. And then these individuals will lead the company. So, um, you know, they will pick vice presidents of different departments. Um, and then you'll have, uh, in, from a financial standpoint, you have the chief financial officer who will also manage the controller and the treasurer, so different positions. So what are some features of a corporation? Well, as a stockholder, you have a right to vote, okay? So any matters that come before the stockholders, you can vote on. You have a right to receive dividends, so you'll receive a proportionate share of any dividend. So if you own 1%, you'll get 1% of whatever dividend gets um, declared. Uh, for liquidation, if, if the company gets liquidated, you have a right to a proportionate share of any assets that remain. So once all liabilities have been paid off, if there are any assets left over and you own 1% of the corporation, you get 1% of those leftover assets. And you have the right to something called preemption, 
which means if the company sells more shares, you have the right to maintain your um, proportionate ownership share in the corporation. So if you own 1% and the company is looking to sell more shares, they have to first give you the option to try and buy shares so that you can continue to keep your 1% ownership stake. Otherwise, it keeps getting diluted every time new shares get issued and sold. So, so far, we've been talking about the stockholders' equity section, and we've talked about two parts of the stockholders' equity section. There's the paid-in capital. So, so far, we've mostly talked about common stock here. But in this um, section, we're also going to talk about preferred stock. So, this is going to include any of these stock accounts and the, also the additional paid-in capital accounts. So, APIC or additional paid in capital is another account that falls all under paid in capital. So this is like the umbrella within stockholders equity and all of these accounts are considered paid in capital. And then the other part of stockholders equity, of course, is retained earnings. So these are the um, the amount of stockholders equity that the corporation earned through profitable operations and these get reduced by dividends here's a stock certificate these don't really exist anymore but back in the day they used to you would notice things on them like the par value the name of the company um, the stockholder name uh, and the number of shares so again these no longer exist um, but sometimes you'll run into somebody who still has an old stock certificate from before computers kind of took over everything. So two classes of stock, there's common stock. For publicly traded companies, pretty much mo this is mostly what they have, but you'll also see a lot of preferred stock, especially if you work for technology companies that aren't public yet. So in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's a lot of companies um, that, aren't, that are big, for example, Uber, where you would see a lot of shares of preferred stock there. So common stock is the most basic form of stock, represents the owners of the corporations. You get those four basic rights we talked about in an earlier slide, and you stand to get the most benefit if the corporation succeeds. When you have preferred stock, there are certain advantages you get over common stock. If the company were to liquidate, the preferred stockholders are first in line to get paid back. If anything's left over, then so this is it, receive assets first in the liquidation, and they also receive dividends first. So um, the preferred stockholders have to get paid out all their dividends before any dividends can go to common stock. So you can see how this is, if let's say somebody has a startup in San Francisco in technology, you might give the owner common stock, but if you are just an outside investor, you will probably demand preferred stock because you don't want the owner to simply liquidate the company and pay themselves out dividends and assets. You want to be the first in line for that. So that's the advantage here. So this is pretty rare in practice, but again, you will see this often in the San Francisco Bay Area if you work for technology companies. So here's some more comparison of common stock, preferred stock, and long-term debt. So really three different ways to um, finance your company. So do you have to repay any principal? Not with common stock, not with preferred stock, but yes, you do with long-term debt. It, are there any dividends or interest payments? Or, or how do they get treated, right, in this case? So this is talking about the tax treatment. So dividends, you do not get a tax deduction for either common or preferred stock, but for long-term debt, interest expense is tax deductible. So you do get a tax savings on that. Do you have an obligation to pay dividends or interest? With common stock, only after you've declared it. Same rule with preferred stock, only if you declare dividends do you have to pay them. Um, but with long-term debt, you do have fixed rates and dates, right? You have a contract, there must, payments must be made. So it's a little bit riskier in that you have to make payments with long-term debt. But common stock, preferred stock, you don't have to declare a dividend, but keep in mind you're giving somebody an ownership interest in your company. So there's, um, in addition to classes of stock, there's this concept of par value and no par value stock. Um, so par, this is kind of a legal term. I don't want to go too deep into this to confuse you guys, but basically it's something that came around, let's call it 100 years ago, probably even more now, uh, when, corporate, when the concept of corporations really grew. Um, so this is just an arbitrary amount, like a made-up amount assigned by a company when it issues its stock. 
Okay, there's some legal issues around it. Again, I don't really want to dive into them here. I don't want to focus on that here, but you're welcome to kind of Google about, you know, what is par value stock? Why is there par and all that? If you want to learn a little bit more about it, it is interesting, but again, I don't want to spend the time here to go over through that. So usually this gets set very low. You can issue no par stock that does not have a par value. Sometimes it may have a stated value. This is pretty rare in practice. So most stuff in practice is gonna have par or par value. And so that affects how we account for it. So that's why we need to introduce this concept um, of par and no par stock. So let's talk about this. So the first example should be totally repeat from what we've done before, because we've assumed uh, indirectly before that we were issuing at par or that the stock had no par. So common stock at par, if Home Depot raises 100 million by issuing stock, okay, and this is going to be at par, right? So par value is equal to issuance price of $10. All we're gonna do is debit cash for 100 million, right? $10 per share times 10 million shares. And we're gonna credit this account common stock for 100 million. So that's issuing common stock. We've done this multiple times in this class now, should we repeat? But what happens if Home Depot has a stock with par value of $0.05 cents per share? So very similar way that we're going to account for it as we just did here. But the difference is the cash amount is still going to be the same. But now we're going to credit common stock at the par amount. So $0.05 cents per share, 10 million shares, half a million dollars. So that's what we're crediting common stock for. The remaining amount is going to go into an account called paid in capital. Okay, so the remaining $9.95 times 10 million shares or 99,500,000 is going to go into paid in capital. Okay, this is just another um, type of uh, account under st stockholders equity. So that's the only difference between this slide and this slide. So here's the balance sheet for that. So it shows you when we show on the balance sheet, we're going to show common stock at a par value, how 10 billion shares authorized. Remember, authorized came from the charter, right? We have 10 million shares issued and outstanding. So we, we're authorized to issue up to 10 billion. So far, we've only issued 10 million shares. That 10 million shares is going to be held on the books at par, which is the 500,000, and everything else is paid in capital, you see right there. And that's our total paid in capital. And then of course we have retained earnings and that gives us our total stockholders equity so far. So let's do another example here. No par common stock. That This is gonna be the same exact approach as having issued at par. So no par, Krispy Kreme Donuts issues this many million shares, no par common stock for this dollar amount debit cash, credit common stock, right? Same thing as we've done back in chapter two. How does Krispy Kreme show on their stockholders equity on the balance sheet? How does it show no par common stock? Well, in this case, it's gonna be common stock, no par. So all of it's gonna go into the common stock account, right? We're not gonna have this paid in capital that we had here. So for Krispy Kreme, you can see we don't have that. Krispy Kreme, instead of retained earnings, actually has accumulated deficit, meaning that over the life of the firm, they've lost money. So then total stockholders' equity is just all the stock they've issued less the money they've lost. What happens if we issue stock for assets other than cash? This is pretty straightforward, believe it or not. We're just gonna take the market value of the assets that we get. In this case, we're getting equipment and a building. We're gonna debit those asset accounts for the market value. And we're gonna treat it just like as if we had received $124,000 in cash. So in this case, these are 15,000 shares, $1 par. So we're gonna credit common stock, 15,000 times $1 par, $15,000 and the rest is going to go paid in capital in excess of par common stock, right? So 109,000 is going to go as the remainder. So this is issuing $1 common stock instead of for cash, we're getting it for we're getting equipment and a building. 
The same exact concept works if you issue stock for services. So let's say that this company, Khan, engages an attorney. The attorney sends a bill for $25,000. Instead of giving the attorney $25,000 of cash, the company offers 2,500 shares, a dollar par value common stock, and that's the settlement of the fee. We look at the fair market value of the stock, which is $10 per share. So there's a legal expense debit, $25,000. Right? We've issued $2,500 um, par stock, so we're going to credit common stock for that $2,500. The remaining amount is going to go here into paid in capital in excess of par common. So there is a little bit of this ethical challenge when you think about it. So take a moment and stop here and think about what happens when you receive an asset other than cash and you have to record the asset received and the stock issued at fair market value. What if, for example, you get software and you have to come up with how much the software is worth? Well, you can imagine it's hard to value software. You can issue it at just about any price you want. So you can just say the software is worth half a million dollars or half a billion dollars or whatever the case may be, and you can debit this asset and credit common stock for that amount, and that makes it look like you have this huge company, right? So you can be a DVC student, and you can um, just create some software and say it's worth you know, $500 billion, and you can say, wow, walk around and say, I have a $500 billion company, but clearly you've just come up with an arbitrary number for the value. And this is a challenge when the asset that the company receives doesn't have a very clear value in the marketplace. See, so again, if your computer whiz friend invites you to invest in the new business and shows you this balance sheet, you might be impressed, right? Assume that these numbers are even bigger. You might get really impressed and say, wow, this is a huge company. That's really impressive. But this asset, it was just a made up value by your friend. What about issuing preferred stock? Same pattern as common stock, okay? You probably are going to see separate paid in capital accounts in excess of par. So you'll see one for preferred and one for common. Some preferred stock will also be issued with a conversion feature. It allows the preferred shareholders to exchange preferred shares for common. In fact, when a company isn't public yet, pre-IPO, and then it goes and has an initial public offering or IPO, oftentimes the preferred shareholders must convert to common stock. So most public companies really only have common stock outstanding. So let's look at an example of issuing preferred stock. This is going to be convertible preferred stock, $1 par, 50,000 shares are issued at par. Same as before. Cr debit cash for $50,000. Credit, instead of common stock, this is going to be called convertible preferred stock, 50,000. So this is issuing convertible preferred stock. What about converting preferred stock? So you'll probably have some sort of ratio or rate. In this case, this is converted preferred stock to common stock at a rate of 6.2 to 1 shares, right? So 8,000 shares of, so basically you're giving up 6.25 um, shares of preferred stock for one share of common stock. So if you have 50,000 shares of preferred stock, if you divide that by 6.25, you're going to get 8,000, which is right over here. So what happens? Well, you have to get rid of this convertible preferred stock. It's been converted. It no longer exists. So that's why we're debiting the 50,000, right? We created it here. And now we have to get rid of it here. And in its place, we're going to have common stock, 8,000. Why 8,000? $1 par times 8,000 shares. Right? Look up here. And then the additional amount, the 42,000, is going to go paid in capital in excess of par common. So this is converting preferred into common stock. Let's look at some more terminology. Authorized, issued, outstanding. Authorized, remember, came from the charter when we set up the corporation. It's the maximum number of shares the company can issue. 
issued are the number of shares the company has issued to stockholders. Outstanding are the number of shares that the stockholders own. So how is issued different from outstanding? Well, if you take all the stock you issued and subtract treasury stock, that gives you the outstanding stock. So your next question might be, well, what is treasury stock? Well, let's talk about treasury stock. So treasury stock is when a company buys its own stock that it issued and then re required, right? So bought back in the marketplace. So you might ask yourself, why in the world would a company buy its own stock in the marketplace? So what are some of the reasons? Well, maybe they need some stock to distribute to employees as a bonus. Maybe they think that the stock is really low and want to buy some in the marketplace and then sell it later for a higher price. Maybe they're afraid that there's somebody out there accumulating a bunch of shares to try and get greater than 50%. And so they want to avoid a takeover by acquiring some of the shares so somebody can't get this greater than 50%. Perhaps they want to increase earnings per share, right? Remember that earnings per share is a ratio that gives you um, basically the, um, uh, well, we'll let's talk about this in a little bit. We're going to do a few slides ahead. We're going to do that. But you can increase your earnings per share by buying back some of the, the stock. Or there may be a repurchase program where you want to return excess cash to shareholders and the way you do that is buy back stock in the open marketplace because if there's fewer shares outstanding, then presumably the value per share will go up. So rather than pay a dividend, you just repurchase shares out in the marketplace. So from an accounting standpoint, how do we record treasury stock? Well, when we purchase treasury stock, we're going to record it at whatever we paid. So it's just going to be recorded at cost. We're going to forget about par value for tr uh, accounting with tr for treasury stock. This is going to be a contra stockholders equity account. Treasury stock is a contra stockholders equity account, meaning we normally have a debit balance in it. We're going to report this beneath retained earnings on the balance sheet. So here we have our common stock. We've talked about that forever now. Now we know what paid in capital is. We also have retained earnings or accumulated deficit as we saw in the Krispy Kreme example, right? We have this other accumulated other comprehensive loss. So we didn't dive that much into this account in this class. You will look at it later, but there's some other factors. Um, for example, when we have uh, available for sale um, investments and they have an unrealized gain or loss, that would go into things like this. Uh, then we, at the very bottom here, we have treasury stock. So as you can see, treasury stock is a contra, this is a contra stockholders equity. So we are, it is going down, it's decreasing stockholders equity. So treasury stock decreases our stockholder equity balance. So let's go through an example here of treasury stock. So this is an entry when we buy 53 million shares for $7 billion. So we go out into the marketplace and we buy 53 million shares for $7 billion of our own stock. So treasury stock is our own stock. We're going to debit treasury stock, $7 billion. We're going to credit cash because that's how we pay for it, $7 billion. Not all that difficult, right? This is at cost. Right? We, avoid, we ignore par value. One option is to retire treasury stock, cancel the stock certificates, then we cannot reissue them. Right, So um, once we do this, neither total assets nor total liabilities get affected. So you'll see maybe as you learn, you'll figure out why assets equals liabilities plus stockholders equity. This would not get affected. And all we're going to do is a memo entry that where we decrease the number of shares issued in stockholders equity when we retire treasury stock. This is not that common. Most of the time we're going to resell the treasury stock back into the marketplace. This is going to increase assets and equity by whatever cash we receive when we sell it back. We'll never show a gain or loss on treasury stock transactions. It doesn't make sense. We're buying ownership in ourselves. So it would be weird to show a gain or a loss. Instead, when we have what you would think of as a gain or a loss, so when we have amounts that are in excess, 
of the original amount paid or short of the original amount paid, we're going to record those into the paid in capital from treasury stock transactions. So again, an example is best here. So remember those shares. Um, so here in this case, on July 22nd, 2016, Home Depot resold a million shares of treasury stock for $90 per share. Assuming that the average cost of the treasury shares was $70.15 per share. So in this case, they sold at $90 per share, a million shares. So they received 90 million of cash. Originally, this treasury stock at cost was $70.15 times a million shares. So originally they paid 70,150,000. So they have to decrease treasury stock account by that amount. The excess, the plug here, 19,850,000, is going to go into an account called paid in capital from treasury stock transactions. So this is, you can think of this was like the gain, but we do not show a gain. So this is selling treasury stock. What about issuing stock for employee compensation? So let's say Home Depot issues 4 million new shares in conjunction with an employee stock compensation plan. Par value was 5 cents per share. Well, we're going to debit this expense, compensation expense, for 440 million. We issued the common stock, 4 million at 5 cents par. So our, we're going to credit common stock at the par value, 200,000. Everything else is going to go into paid in capital. So this is very similar to acquiring a building, paying a legal expense, even issuing stock for cash where we have a par value. So this is recording stock based compensation. And again, let's look at the Home Depot stockholders' equity section. So you have the common stock here, the paid in capital, retained earnings, this other comprehensive income or loss. In this case, it's a small loss. And then less treasury stock, right? So we've got to remove the treasury stock part of it. And so our total stockholders' equity is right there. Again, this is negative because this is a contra, whoops, contra stockholders' equity account treasury stock. So here's a quick summary of treasury stock transactions. Buying treasury stock, assets and equity decrease by the cost of the treasury stock purchased. Just look at the journal entries, look at assets equals liabilities plus stockholders equity and figure out how this changes. What happens when we resell treasury stock? Assets and equity increase by the sales price of the treasury stock sold. What if we retire treasury stock? We just remove it from common stock and treasury. And what happens if we issue stock for employee compensation? Well, expenses, capital stock, and additional paid in capital will all increase. If this doesn't make sense, again, go back and look at the journal entries that we did. Look at what, what accounts are affected, and what are they, right? Stockholders' equity, stockholders' equity, stockholders' equity. Those accounts get affected, and there you go. Expenses, capital, stock, additional paid in capital all go up. So let's look at some retain. Again, this is going to be a refresh on retained earnings and dividends and stock splits. So for retained earnings, just as a refresher, net income minus any net losses unless any dividends declared is how we're going to calculate the retained earnings. So if you remember, we have beginning retained earnings, then we're going to plus or minus net income or net loss, minus dividends, and that gives us ending retained earnings. So retained earnings get accumulated over the corporation's life. If we have a credit balance in retained earnings, that means the lifetime earnings exceeded lifetime losses and dividends paid out. If we have a debit balance in this account, then lifetime losses and dividends exceed the earnings. So we have a deficit, accumulated deficit. So you can see if you go into Tesla's 10K, you will see a deficit rather than a, a retained earnings. Let's look about dividends. Again, dividends is a distribution by the corporation to the shareholders. Okay, Very often, they base dividends on earnings. 
they pay out dividends almost all the time in cash, sometimes in stock, and sometimes very rarely in non-cash assets. So you don't have to pay out dividends in cash. Let's say you uh, open a corporation where you're a hair salon, right? And you take a bottle of shampoo from the um, shelf and you give it to the owner. Well, you've just done a dividend with a non-cash asset. Again, cash dividends are the most common. In order to declare a dividend, you need to both have enough retained earnings and enough cash to pay the dividend. So retained earnings must be there and cash must be there. The board of directors is who has the authority to declare a dividend. There is no liability or no obligation until it is declared. Once you've declared it, you've created a liability. So this creates three dates that we have to think about when we do a dividend. The date you declare it creates a liability, liability journal entry. Date of record, so when they declare it, they're gonna say whatever, whoever owns the shares as of this date called the date of record, though they're gonna get the dividend, right? So the date of record often is a few days after the declaration date. No journal entry here. No journal entry. Here, payment date, you're gonna pay cash, get rid of liability. So you're gonna get you're gonna pay off the liability with cash. So you're gonna have a journal entry here and a journal entry here. So let's look through some examples. You have a declaration date. June 9th, the board of directors declares a $50,000 cash dividend. It's gonna come out of retained earnings and you've created a liability, okay? So this is a liability that you've created. Whoa. So this is declaring a cash dividend, 50,000. The date of record, July 1st. So when they did the declaration, they announced the date of record, the record date, which usually follows the declaration date by a few weeks. So whoever is a stockholder on the record date will receive the journal entry. Again, there, just like I said earlier, there's no journal entry. Um, so sorry, uh, did I say will receive the journal entry? So the stockholders on the record date will receive the dividend. There is no journal entry for this date of record. And then the payment date, you're gonna get rid of the liability and pay out the dividend in cash. So you paid your cash dividend on this payment date. So let's do some analysis of stockholders' equity accounts. Remember, net income is the only item that will increase retained earnings. Net losses will decrease retained earnings. Dividends declared will decrease retained earnings. And then there are some other adjustments to retained earnings, very minor and rare, outside the scope of this class. So when we look at the retained earnings T account, remember we have beginning balance plus net income and then minus dividends equals ending balance. Again, you might have some of these other adjustments. These are rare and outside the scope of this class, but just know there could be some other minor adjustments. So if you're missing something like how much was paid in dividends, if I have all these other parts to it, I can calculate my X. So what about dividends on preferred stock? So remember that Preferred shareholders must receive dividends before the common stockholders. Preferred stock is stated a little bit differently because preferred stock is going to have the dividend already stated as a percent of par value or dollar amount per share. So that's how preferred stock is quoted. Because you're the first one in line to get any dividends, it's quoted as kind of what dividend each share is um, expected to get. And it may be cumulative. It depends on how it's the, the law, the, the legal setup for that company is written around preferred stock. But it may be cumulative, which re- means that the preferred stockholders receive all dividends in arrears before common stockholders get any dividend. So let's look at an example. The preferred stock of Avant Garde Inc. is cumulative, right? So Avantgarde passed the preferred dividend of 150,000 in 2017, meaning they didn't declare a dividend and they just in 2017 and they skipped it. 
So they don't have to pay $150,000, but because it's cumulative, this $150,000 kind of waits until they do declare a dividend. So let's say in 2018, they declare a dividend. Well, before paying any dividends to Common, Avant Garde must first pay preferred dividends of 150,000 for 2017 and 2018. Again, because the preferred stock is cumulative. So 300,000 must first get paid to preferred shareholders and then everything else can go to Common. So if they declare a $500,000 dividend, they're gonna decrease retained earnings by 500,000. And first, they're going to have to pay $300,000 to preferred shareholders, $150,000 for 2017 and $150,000 for 2018. And then whatever's left over can go to common, the other $200,000. So that's what happens when they declare a cash dividend. There's also stock dividends. So instead of providing cash, they can issue stock. Okay. So this is just going to be proportional to the ownership that you have, right? So if they do a dividend of whatever amount and you own 1% of the corporation stock, you're gonna receive 1% of the dividend. This will increase common stock and paid in capital in excess of par common. It will decrease retained earnings. Total equity remains unchanged. Why would you do stock dividends? Well, you want to continue dividends, but you wanna save cash, you wanna conserve cash. You might want to reduce the per share market price of stock, right? You want to make it um, issue more shares so that the per share price drops. Go and take a look at Amazon stock on Yahoo, and you'll see that one share is very expensive. As of this recording, it's over $1,500 per share. So not everybody can afford that expensive of stock, so they might want to make it cheaper per share. There might be, if it's, if it's a small stock dividend, meaning it's 25% or less, you're going to record it at market value. If it's a large stock dividend, meaning greater than 25%, you're going to record it at par value. So let's do an example of a small stock dividend. Home Depot declares and distributes a 10% common stock dividend on February 3rd, 2017. As of this date, there were one billion 203 million shares outstanding the stock was trading for 140 dollars per share so let's record the stock dividend well first we're going to have to calculate the outstanding shares the par value is 10 or sorry not the par value this is a 10 percent stock dividend and it's 140 market value per share of common so the shares outstanding times the percentage the dividend is of these shares outstanding, times the market value per share. So that's how much we're going to debit retained earnings for. We're going to credit common stock for the new shares issued at par, which is the 1,203,000,000 shares outstanding, 10% dividend, $0.05 cents per share par value. This was from an earlier problem earlier. It doesn't say it up here, I don't think. But this was from an earlier example. So the common stock issued at par, and then everything else is going to be paid in capital. So this is declaring and distributing a 10% stock dividend, not cash, but stock. Take a look at this slide. Let this sink in. What about stock splits? This is just increasing the number of shares of stock issued and outstanding. You're going to proportionately reduce the par value. It's going to decrease the market um, price of the stock. So it makes the stock more attractive in the market. No accounts get affected. The best example I can give you of this is the whole company is a pizza. If it's sliced up into four slices, this is the size of the pizza. If I now slice it up into more slices, it's still the same size of the pizza, right? The size of the company has not changed. So all I'm going to do, there's not even going to be a journal entry. All I'm going to do is adjust. So this is before the split is here. And then after the split is here. So in this case, Home Depot had 500 million shares, 10 cents par common stock issued and outstanding. They're going to do a two for one stock split. So what happens? You get the 10 cents par becomes 5 cents par. The 500 shares issued and outstanding becomes 1,000 shares issued and outstanding. You can see the dollar amount is exactly the same. 
if you sub multiply this times this, it equals the same thing as this times this. One little thing to note, the shares authorized do not change. So whatever's written in the charter does not get affected by the stock split. So here's a little bit of a um, overview of the different transactions that we've done so far and how they affect assets, liabilities, and stockholders' equity. So let's look at the company's performance using some new ratios that we're going to learn. So this isn't so much a new ratio. This is just a combination of ratios we've already done. This is DuPont analysis. So we're going to analyze various elements of profitability. So we're going to look on our return of ass on assets, right? So our return on assets, if you guys remember from an earlier chapter, was our net profit margin ratio, which is just net income divided by net sales, multiplied times our asset turnover ratio, our net sales over average total assets. If we multiply that times the leverage ratio, average total assets over common stockholders' equity, what we get is return on equity, the net income that we earn based on average common stockholders' equity. If you remember your basic algebra, when we multiply fractions here, you know, net sales cancels this, and this cancels this, so we're left over with net income over average common stockholders' equity. That's how we get there. But this breakup of these three components is what's called DuPont analysis. So here we go, we have return on assets, right, which is broken out into net profit margin ratio and asset turnover ratio. Multiply that times leverage ratio, and that gives us, all that multiplication gives us return on equity. So here's an example that you can follow along and do the math and figure out you know, how you get to return on assets, the leverage ratio, and how that equals return on equity. All big factors in determining how profitable a company is. And you can compare this, what the return on equity it was during different years of the same company and compare it for a given year against competitors, right? So it looks like Home Depot in 2016 had a much higher return on equity than Lowe's, and the question might be, why is that? Well, it looks like Home Depot had higher net profit margin, they had a higher asset turnover ratio, and they had more leverage, right? So they had a much higher return on equity. And if you're really interested, go to Yahoo Finance and look at how did Home Depot stock do in 2016 and how did Lowe's stock do in 2016 and compare that now that you see these numbers. So then we have earnings per share. We saw this earlier in, this, in the slides and I told you guys I would just wait to show you on this slide so we're there now. So this is the net income that's attributable to each share of a company's outstanding common stock. So your earnings per share is just your net income right here minus your preferred dividends, so net income minus preferred dividends, divided by the weighted average number of common shares outstanding. So sometimes, for example, you know, if you have January 1st, you have 10,000 shares, and then February 1st, you issue 500 shares, and then, you know, April 1st, we buy back um, 1,500 treasury stock, and on and on and on, we need to multiply, okay, from January until February, we had 10,000 shares, so 10,000 times 1 12th. From February until April, we had 10,500 shares because we issued some new shares here. So that's how we calculate the weighted average over a year. Um, you won't really have to deal with that in this class that much, but just understand how to calculate the weighted average because you will have to do it in future classes. In this case, we're probably going to give you most of the information. Um, so this is the earnings per share calculation for Home Depot. So net income in 2016 was $7,957,000,000, right? So there's no preferred stock for Home Depot, so all of it we're going to call is available to common stockholders. So how are we going to calculate earnings per share? And we're calculating what's called the basic earnings per share. We are simply going to take this amount, 7957, divided by the... Um, 
1,229,000,000 shares outstanding. So what is the effect of preferred dividends on earnings per share? So suppose Home Depot had 5 million shares of $100 par value 5% preferred stock outstanding. The common stockholders would be entitled to receive a $5 dividend per share. The stockholders would be um, entitled to receive a $5 dividend per share. The amount of net income attributable to preferred stock would be $25 million. So we would just have to take our earnings minus this $25 million that's due to preferred stock dividends divided by the weighted average common shares outstanding, and that gives us our earnings per share. So how does earnings per share get affected if we decide how to finance the company? Okay, well, if we want to buy an asset, there's really three ways we can finance it. The easiest is finance it with retained earnings, right? Money that we make in the company, don't pay it out to the owners and dividends, use that money to buy assets. That's the lowest risk to the company. Another option is we can just issue more stock. This is less risky, but our earnings per share and the percentage that we own or control becomes diluted because we're issuing more shares. The other option is issue bonds or a note payable. We don't dilute control of the corporation because we're not issuing new stock. We have higher earnings per share, but we're creating more debt and interest payments. Right Now we have debt and interest payments, so we're increasing the risk of the company. So go through here, look at an example of um, a project where Home Depot wants to expand operations. So they have plan one or plan two. Plan one is they need to borrow 500 million at 6%, right? So Home Depot needs 500 million to expand operations. Their net income currently is 300 million and there's 100 million shares of common stock outstanding. And there's two options. And let's see how they affect earnings per share after we do this expansion. Well, if we borrow 500 million at 6%, our net income before we do anything is 300 million, and it's gonna be the same under both scenarios. We expect that this project is gonna have income of 200 million, and it doesn't matter which scenario we use, it's gonna have the same expected net income. Here, we're borrowing 500 million at 6%, that's gonna create 30 million of interest expense each period, so our expected project income is 170 million now. Um, we're gonna have to pay taxes on this 170 million of income. So our net income on this project, when we borrow 500 million, is 102,000. If we instead issue shares, we don't have, there is no interest payment. Our income is 200,000. We have to pay 80,000 of taxes, right? Taxes are 40% of net income. So because we get to deduct interest payments, we have lower net income for when we borrow money. And so our total company net income here is gonna be 120 million. But as you can see, because we had to issue 50 million more shares, our earnings per share went down to $2.80 per share. When we borrowed, our earnings per share was only $4.02, because you can see, we had this total company income divided by 100 million shares or this higher net income but divided by 150 million shares. So let's talk about market capitalization and the P-E ratio. So the company's market value or market capitalization is just the market price times the number of shares outstanding. The price to earnings ratio is the market price of one share divided by earnings per share. So that gives a sense of how much do I have to pay for one dollar of earnings. We also have the dividend yield. This is simply the ratio of the dividends I get per share of stock to the stock's market price per share. So the dividends per share divided by the market price per share. Finally, how are we going to report this section in the financial statements? So specifically within the statement of cash flows, there's going to be three main categories that are going to fall under financing activities. That's issuing stock, 
transactions with treasury stock and paying dividends because you were dealing with the owners. So this is falls under financing activities in the statement of cash flows. So here we go, cash flows from financing activities. We are repurchasing common stock. So cash went out because we did, tre you know, this was treasury stock. We sold common stock, we issued it or whatever the case may be. So some cash came in and we paid cash dividends to shareholders, so cash went out. So this is our cash flows from financing activities. We issued new stock. In this case, we received cash of 218 million. We spent 6.9 billion on treasury stock, right? So issuing stock was here, treasury stock was here, and we paid dividends here. Uh, in the real world, you might see one of these things called the Consolidated Statement of Stockholders' Equity. It just gives you a lot of detail about what happened in a given period. In this case, it's over two years. It goes from um, February 1st, 2015, and then to 2016, right? So it shows you two periods, 2015 to 2016 and 2016 to 2017. And it's simply showing you all the components of how your balance of stockholders' equity changed from period to period, where that change came from, right? Whether it was treasury stock transactions, dividends paid, whatever the case may be. In a more basic level, so this is kind of how we see in the teaching format, we have all this detail of paid in capital, uh, right, common stock, but in the real world here, under stockholders equity, you're really just gonna see preferred stock, whatever percent it is, whatever the par is, so this is the dividend percent, right? Then you'll see common stock, the par, the shares authorized, issued, outstanding, additional paid in capital, retained earnings, any uh, treasury stock, this other comprehensive income account, and that's gonna give you your total stockholders equity. So on the balance sheet in the real world, this is what you'll generally see as the stockholders equity section. So just some general guidelines to getting comfortable with stockholders' equity and the financial statements. So preferred stock is gonna come first. It's usually just reported as a single amount. The common stock is gonna list the par value per share, the number of shares authorized, issued, and outstanding. The balance of the common stock account is determined as common stock equals the number of shares issued times par value per share. Additional paid in capital is gonna take paid in capital in excess of par plus any paid in capital from other sources. So there's gonna be other accounts, especially in intermediate accounting, where you're gonna, other transactions I should say, where you're gonna put the excess or the, the shortage into paid in capital. So additional paid in capital belongs to the common stockholders. You'll also have outstanding stock. Remember that equation is just the stock that was issued minus any treasury stock, that equals outstanding. Retained earnings is gonna come after you do all those paid in capital accounts. Then underneath, you're gonna have treasury stock. Usually it's recorded at cost and it's a deduction. And finally, you'll have this other comprehensive income, this accumulated other comprehensive income or loss. So sometimes this gets listed before, sometimes after treasury stock. So again, we've now completed basically um, the balance sheet. So, uh, you know, the stockholders equity section was all in this chapter. There's a lot of new vocabulary. Hopefully some of the journal entries are pretty repetitive. Um, definitely feel free to ask any questions that may pop up. As you work problems, hopefully this stuff will start making more sense. Good luck.